This is Glendon Hall in Northamptonshire, a building with over 400 years of history. And this bit round here belongs to Martin Hipwell, who decided to build his mother a new house. But when he dug the foundations, he uncovered every builder's worst nightmare. A dead body. And not just one, but another one, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. So what are they all doing in the outbuildings of an English country house? And just as importantly, how come no one knew they were there? Martin's family live in the stable block, overlooking the Victorian workshop where he discovered the bodies. How's your mum facing up to the fact that there are all these dead bodies under where they're going to live? I'm more concerned about the skeletons and how they feel about mother coming to live here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you find them? The builder, um, who was on the digger, just came across a piece of bone, which initially we thought was um, obviously animal, um, but um, realised uh, later that it was quite obviously human, and it was this part of a, a forehead. How long was it after that that you realised that there wasn't just one body but a whole load? Straight away, within within ten minutes. Mate, this is the very first time you've seen these, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. What do you reckon? What's your instinct? Well, if if this is the density of them, yeah. where all these yellow marks are, then it suggests it's a cemetery. And if the alignment of these is right, I guess it, this is what east-west for these. Yeah, burials? yes, almost exactly yes. Then we'd, we'd assume they were Christian. So it looks to me like some sort of medieval cemetery. I would, you know, that'd be the period I'd think of. Medieval cemetery sound right to you? Well, we know there was a church at Glendon many, many years ago. We don't know where it was. Right. It would be very interesting to know where the church was. First of all, we'll get to work on two of Martin's friends in the south to see what they can tell us about the place where they were buried. Phil will need to dig through a lot of building rubble before he reaches his skeleton, but Jackie McKinley, our burials expert, can already see some bone. I've got some skull here, but it's pretty smashed. Martin's found bodies all over his building site. Just a few feet away from Jackie, inside the incident room, he's discovered the skeleton of a child. And there was a line of five adults under the table where Stuart and Henry are scouring the maps for evidence of the church. So what, what you got in, Jackie? Well, I have got some skull here. You can see it's ever so close to the surface. And at the same level, I've got bits of blue plastic turning up. So whether it's in situ or it's been redeposited, I don't know. Because I can see there's, there's a bit of bone there. Yeah. You can't actually trace it around. Yeah. And there's another bit there. Yeah. But at least with a skull there, at least you've got something to, to work to and you've yeah. got a level to work to. Yeah. yeah. And got a level to work to at the minute. There's a lot of tumbled windows here and stuff. But that's interesting because that looks like it's part of a very large window mm -hmm. originally with, with sort of round rather than pointed right. heads to it. Does that look part of, do they like church windows to you? It could be church, I mean they, they could even be domestic with that but e even if they are church they'll suggest that something radical going on with this church in the early 16th century. This looks oh. like marble. Decorated isn't it? Yeah and that looks, it is marble. So, so all these bits of church that you see here uh, you would think are from the church we're, we're looking for? I would think so, yeah. Uh, not necessarily in the right order, but from the church <laughs> you're looking for. Yeah, certainly. So the folly doesn't look like it's the church itself, but at least we now know we're looking for a posh late medieval church. Perhaps that could have been connected to some grand house that was here before the current Glendon Hall. And maybe the people buried in its graveyard lived in that very house. So we might have a row of graves here, and then perhaps a gap, and then another grow of graves here, another gap, so on and so forth. We're plotting the graves as we find them to work out the shape of the cemetery, and there seems to be a gap under part of the incident room. Geophys are sent in to investigate, but even with ground-penetrating radar, they are finding it difficult to see through the concrete floor. The graves we've got in this area, just round there there's an infant, the two graves that Phil had over there have got what looked like an infant and a juvenile in them. And the only adult bone we've had is out of the redeposited bone out of the pit that he's got there. The grave cuts are narrow and the arms seem to be positioned tight to the body as if shrouded. This suggests that these are poor burials and not residents of any previous hall. 
But it turns out that Glendon used to be much more than just a big house. It's described in the Doomsday Book as a settlement consisting of nine households, the remains of which could be in the fields surrounding the hall. See this, this bank running along here? Yeah. This yeah. is interesting because it, it's exactly parallel to the line of that hollow way. What's well, the old, by, by the trees. Yeah, the old roadway. And it's quite possible this is like a back boundary to properties which were uh, fronting that, that roadway. Oh, right, OK. Day two here at Glendon Hall in Northamptonshire where we've discovered over 30 medieval burials. And this morning we're going to peel back all this earth here to see if we can find the church that goes with them. And we're extending a trench over here to find the extent of the cemetery. Also one on the far side of this building, another one in there, and a fourth one deep in here, which could prove a little bit difficult. Matt's starting to take off layers of building rubble to look for the church. Meanwhile, Kerry has begun to expose an adult skeleton, which looks in much better nick than the multiple burials emerging from Phil's pit. Well, this is getting really complicated in here. I mean, back at this end, we've got a burial. We've got the, the hand and, and part of the, the thigh bone down in here. And that represents a, a burial which is in here. And it's obviously extending underneath here. And then on the top of that, we've got this stone line burial with this a deposit of, of just jumbled bones mm. which must have been put in either when this burial went in or when they actually put the building up. So if this is a uh, comparatively late grave, we're probably looking at something that's really of relatively high status. I mean, somebody's taken a lot of care and trouble over getting these stones, bringing them in, lining the grave. It, it, it's quite amazing this is the only grave on the site that has got stones like this. We'll only lift the burials that Martin's building work would disturb. The others will be allowed to remain where they are in the grounds of Glendon Hall. Yesterday, we were looking for the reason why the old hollow way was diverted from its original course straight through Glendon. But frustratingly, geophys aren't able to come up with an explanation. If it's not beside the kink in the road, it's even more likely that our church is inside the cemetery. So Ian is about to put in our third test pit, deep in the undergrowth on the east side. Once he gets the digger into the copse, he'll be on the lookout for more burials. At the other end of the cemetery, Rakshar has found a piece of a child's jawbone. Do we know how old it is at all? Well, it's obviously an infant, it's still got his milk teeth. This is a milk tooth, that's a milk tooth, and you've got one of the permanent teeth coming through, developed in there, so oh, yes. it's about sort of three to four, something like that. So we now know that the cemetery extends further to the west, but in the east, there are no signs of any more burials. Jackie is taking a look at the skeleton in Kerry's trench. It's much smaller and more gracile than some of the other adult skeletons we've seen. What does gracile mean? Quite slightly built, petite, one might say. Yeah. This angle here looks fairly broad, which would suggest you've got a female, but it'd be easier to tell when we can see more of it. What about these bones here? Well, that looks like we've got at least two there, unless somebody's got three big toes, which isn't very likely. Mm -hmm. So there's at least parts of two more going off in that direction. And again, adult ones, they look like. Phil's burials are still multiplying. He's now revealed a stone-lined grave, a jumble of bones, a child, and the skeleton of a baby. So we've got four interconnecting burials, yeah. all in a very small space, which really is probably what I'd expect from a medieval cemetery. Yeah, but it seems to be very different from what we've got over here, with what looks like graves that are neat and tidy and respecting each other. Ah, seems to be. I mean, you've got to remember, with these burials, we haven't yet lifted one intact skeleton. and We don't actually know that they're actually sitting on the bedrock natural. It's perfectly possible that there might be more bodies underneath. We're beginning to work on the village where these people lived. Stuart's looking for a spot to put in a trench to confirm that the platforms on the south side of the Holloway really are the remains of the village of Glendon. 
while Jeff is are hoping to add some detail to the earthwork survey in the north field by using magnetometry, which shows up signs of occupation such as ditches and pits. What's all this? This is the Glendon Dog uh, Graveyard, Tony. Dog Graveyard? Yeah, the pets and the pack animals that uh, lived here many years ago. We've even got a ledger here dating back to 1793 with some of the dogs' names. We've got Lively, Lady, Lily, Lovely. Have you seen this one? Yes. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Tony. It's ironic, isn't it? that on the far side of this building we've got the Victorians hacking the earlier dead bodies to pieces, totally failing to record their names, while at the same time on this side of the building they're creating their own little idyllic graveyard to the memory of their pets. We're beginning to find some pottery where our village might have stood. What you got? Looking at this, it's all the sort of the standard medieval course words we get around here. It starts in the sort of 12th century goes through the 13th, 14th. Right. This bit's particularly interesting because it's, um, it's a medieval Shelley word jug handle. The jug handles like this only tend to be 12th century. They go right. out when the glazed industry comes in, right. in the 13th. So that gives us a reasonably early day. It's quite nice, that. Well, there's quite a lot of other stuff down here, look. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, look at that, that's lovely. Um, well, that's your 13th, 14th century glazed ware. That's sort of Stanion lived in. It's only made like about 10 miles up the road. I mean, with that and these, I mean, we're looking 12th to 14th century, probably. Well, it's, that's just the life of the settlement, isn't it? It, it is. It's all, it's all coming out of this earthwork here, which we yeah. think is the house. And yeah. It's all in concentration. Well, you've got more pottery out of this trench than you've got from the whole of the cemetery yeah. area up there. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> sure this is where they live in. The earthworks give the game away, you know. So. Yeah. yeah, true, true. Things are progressing in the cemetery. By the end of the second day, another skeleton is emerging in Raksha's first test pit, but nothing more from either of two further test pits. So by the end of day two, we have the extent of the cemetery on the north, the west and the east. The church should be somewhere within this area. This grave cut marks the furthest west point of our cemetery. Behind me over there, we've got around 40 bodies. Not only that, but we know the names of some of the people and even how much land they had. But if we want to find out more about their lives, we're going to have to look further afield than here. We're going to have to get really stuck into the earthworks, the site of the original medieval village. Two of the villagers who lived and worked in these fields are being revealed for the first time since they died six to seven centuries ago. Jack is preparing to lift the tiny pelvis of a baby who was probably born a few weeks premature and didn't survive the birth. See all this pottery? Yeah. It's all late Saxon. Um, this piece in particular has got me really excited. Can you see the traces of red paint on it? I mean, probably a little oh, bit crikey, difficult yes. to see. Yeah, yeah. We know where this is from, it's from Stamford. They've dug the kiln. That's no later than about 910 AD. So Martin's friends in the south weren't the first people in Glendon. But the hard life that they led is evident in their bones even now. If we start off here, he's got really bad Ooh. dental abscesses. Oh, yeah. That's just one of them there. And that would have been both very painful and his breath would have been quite smelly. You wouldn't want it needed to stand this close to him. <laughs> oh, oh, God! That's oh, you horrible creature! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me! <laughs> How well, old is he? About your age, I should think. Yeah, so, sort of older. -ish. Prime of life! <laughs> yes, if you say so, Phil. And then we've got some sinusitis. If you look just inside this area here, you can see there's this very fine woven new bone. Mm inside the sinus cavity. Now this is this part of the sinus, and you, you know how painful yeah. it is when you get sinusitis, it goes right up into your head. So he'd have had a bad head as well, but his spine's the real giveaway, because this tells us what kind of a, a hard life he had and how much physical labor he did. You can see he's got this new bone growth around the edge of the vertebra, and these are called osteophytes, and that, that's basically a reflection of age-related wear and tear. So he's been doing a lot of hard physical manual labour, lots of bending and lifting, probably a bit like you've been doing over the past three days, lots of shoveling and that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I've been doing it for more than three days. Well, I've been doing it my whole lifetime. Well, he, he probably has. <laughs> well, you, you might actually look like this underneath. Mm. 
working in these fields would have been slow and backbreaking. Today we have modern mechanical diggers, but they don't seem to be helping us locate the village where our peasant farmers lived. It's too clean, isn't it? It's just way too clean. Yeah. What we really need is like, you know, big piles of bone and pot and black stuff. It's just not there. If our medieval peasants weren't living in the south field, surely they must have been in the north field. But we've only got half a day left to find out. Straight away, it looks like we're starting to get some results. Oh, bingo, look at that. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. That's it. That's 13th century, yeah, yeah. Mind you, we're getting pottery over the other side. We didn't have any features to go with it. Oh, we've got features here. Look. Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't it? Just in this area here is, is a mound, just, just there. Oh, yeah. And the position of it, when you compare it with Victor's drawing, gives you the exact perspective and line that matches the drawing. And what I think that mound is, is a garden feature on which they put something like a, an oblesque. So or that's a, an the spike catcher. we can see on that's the it, yeah. right. I think it's a garden feature. It fits in with the design layout we see for this parkland. And it's exactly the sort of thing you get yeah. in this kind of grand landscape. Such grand gardens seem worlds away from the lives of the medieval peasants in our cemetery, who somehow managed to keep the village going for 150 years after the Black Death. Phil's finally ready to find out what's inside the stone-lined grave he found yesterday. There's something buried underneath there. It's a big old stone, isn't it? It is. Go on, have a look. Ooh. Anything underneath oh. there? Wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> Don't give me that. <laughs> I can't see anything. <laughs> I'm afraid. Shall I hold the matter? Can you have a look? Yes. Yeah, well, no, I'm not. Oh, no. you, have you got it? Yep. Oh, look, one bit of bone. That's what I thought. Um, yeah. Come on back, you can do it. Under the stone is yet more bone, so we have another conundrum on our hands. Perhaps we're not looking at a grave after all. So this could be sitting on top of this great mass of redeposited bone, and could actually be the base of a grave, do you think? The base of a stone-lined grave? I don't, know I don't think, no, because it, it, it would put the grave up there. Yeah, and that's too high, do you think? I th I'm sure it is. Right. I just wonder whether it, I mean, I wonder if it's not a wall foundation, is it? Wall of what, were you precisely thinking? <coughs> wall of church, were you thinking? Well, I mean, so, it makes you wonder. Mm. At last, this is the clue we've been waiting for. The stone lies at the end of the robbed-out wall which Phil discovered earlier. Our archaeologists agree that it seems most likely that the original 13th century church must have been where the rear of the incident room stands. An extension was added later over the first burials that Martin found. So we've all learned a lot from this. We've been on a steep learning curve and it sort of changed our ideas. It's a lesson for all of us. I mean, there's no stone buildings there and they should be in those enclosures. So where is the village? Well, we know where it isn't because we know where all the medieval fields are around here. We know it's not down the other end. So there's only one place it can be, really. Which is? Under these buildings behind, behind us. <laughs> I mean, Northamptonshire villages almost always find the church in the heart of the village, and the church is just over there. The medieval village of Glendon must have been near the church where the rambling buildings of Glendon Hall now stand. In 1514, a new landowner decided that sheep pasture would be a more profitable use of land, and so he pulled down most of the houses, evicting 62 people. Shortly after that, the first Glendon Hall was built, and the church became a private chapel complete with expensive Flemish glass. The next four centuries saw generations of landowners demolish, build and add to the hall, just as Martin was doing when he found his first friend in the south. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Burford in Oxfordshire is one of the finest medieval towns in England. Almost every house here is picture postcard perfect. And the granddaddy of them all is this one, 
the Priory. This sprawling mansion is being restored with great care because underneath it is thought to lie a medieval hospital. But that might just be the start of it. The owners called in our very own Mick Aston, who stumbled across something rather surprising in the garden. So the fact that we're here is all down to you. Yeah, I'm afraid it is, actually. I, I, I was asked to come here and look at this building and then wandered off and looked at the grounds around it, thought it was really interesting and we ought to come back and do more work. I bet you're great to employ. You were asked <laughs> to look at this fantastic place and you're poking around the back. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a medieval uh, hospital on the site, but up on the hill at the back, we found 10th century pottery. So that's Anglo-Saxon? Yeah. When you say you found it, where was it? It, it, was, it was in the vegetable patch on the top of the hill, but it's earlier than the date of the town of Burford when that's found in the 12th century. So there's something here that much earlier. And finding that was sufficiently exciting for you to come to us and say, I really want to dig it. So, medieval hospital or Anglo-Saxon settlement? It looks like Mick's got us looking for both in this massive garden. That's over a 1,000 years of history to sort out. At least our search for the hospital should be fairly straightforward. Fingers crossed, John's radar has picked up part of it under the front lawn. It means we can put in our first trench straight away. Our second target is the vegetable garden, and it's going to be a lot harder. This is where Mick found his mysterious Anglo-Saxon pottery, and he wants us to scour it for more. It's not exactly small. So we've called in some extra help. Welcome back to Burford in Oxfordshire, where we're trying to uncover the secrets of Burford Priory, the biggest house in town. Down here, we think we may have the first glimmerings of a medieval hospital. Why are we so sure that there are likely to be medieval remains here? Well, the archaeology doesn't just stop at the front door. Excuse the mess, this is the incident room, by the way. But look at these arches. Now, even I can tell that these are medieval, but what puzzles me is that it all seems far too grand to be a priory. Antonia, you know more about this place than anyone else. You actually wrote the book on Burford. Is this really a priory? No, it's a private house, and it has been for the best part of 500 years. So why is it called a priory? Because it stands on the site of a medieval hospital. But one's a priory and the other's a hospital. There seems to be some confusion over the name towards the late 15th, 16th century when even the records refer to the Priory or the Prior of Burford. What's our earliest reference to the hospital? Right, the earliest reference is this close roll of 1226 in which the King grants to the Hospital of St John in Burford ten cartloads of wood from the Forest of Witchwood. But in addition to the medieval stuff, which we're pretty sure is here, Mick's been getting very excited about the idea of Anglo-Saxon finds. Is it likely that we'll find anything Anglo-Saxon? Oh, I hope so. I Why? Hope so. The place named Burford is Saxon in origin, and it relates to the ford leading to or by the Burr. And what's a Burr? A Burr is a fortified enclosure, um, which would either have been used in times of stress when people could use as a refuge, or it might have been inhabited. OK, so the name's a good Anglo-Saxon clue, but that's all we've got. So far, but fingers crossed. So, apart from the odd leftover arch, the big house bears almost no resemblance to the 13th century hospital. As lovely as it is, this building dates from the 1580s. Our best chance of finding the hospital lies under the front lawn. And out back, we're also going to see if we've got some kind of Anglo-Saxon settlement. The question is, which one will we find first? Phil thinks he's made a good start. He's found stone. But he's being given a run for his money. Because in the vegetable garden, our junior archaeologists are coming up trumps. That dates from about the time of William the Conqueror. So that's really, 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 really old. So that's great. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you've been doing this for about 10 minutes, have you? Something like that. So that's both digs off to a good start. But the sheer size of the Priory Garden is a challenge in itself. It's one of the biggest we've ever dug on Time Team. It's got rows of topiary, Victorian flower beds, even a 17th century chapel. And that's the problem. It's so big, we could find anything here. We've got half a dozen trenches open in the vegetable garden alone. 
and we're getting a lot more pottery, most of it late Saxon, early Norman. Oh, marvellous, look at this. The ten. The ten. There's a clear cut-off date around 1100, but we still don't know where the pottery's coming from, so we've got to keep digging. Over on the front lawn, Phil's row of stones has turned into the corner of a large wall, which lines up perfectly with the geophys. Could this be our medieval hospital? Well, some 13th century hospitals could be very big, but most had two main buildings, a long infirmary hall for the sick and a chapel, either on the end or on the side. So which one does Phil have? You can't tell whether you're outside or inside there, can you? Oh, surely I must be inside. I mean, that's got to be an outside wall or at least part of an outside wall and then turn round and go in round there. I'm sure that must be outside and I'm on the inside. And just to prove Phil doesn't make this stuff up, look at this lovely floor tile. It must mean we're inside a building. This is exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to find in a very posh 13th, yes. 14th century yes, building. It is, isn't it? Like yeah. a chapel. Yes, yeah. yes. So this could be one of our hospital buildings, the chapel. And the second, the hall, might be closer than we think. Oh, yeah, look. Well, you better have a good reason for dragging me up here. No, right? I have. I have. Because you can see the whole town from here, look. Cool. And look That's across there, look, there's our hospital, the Priory site, look. From here, you can really clearly see how there's quite a substantial hill behind it, can't you? Yeah, where the trees are at the back is where the Saxon pottery's coming from. But then in front of us, you've got all this medieval new town laid out. Uh, you know, you come over the, the ford, over the River Windrush down there, and then you've got the main street up the middle, and you've got all these carefully laid out properties running back from that. When would the new town have been built? Well, this one's about 1100. Uh, which is quite early, because there are literally hundreds of them founded in the 1100s and 1200s. Everybody's at it, because you can make money out of building a new town. We, what's actually happening is that's the earlier settlement. It's probably one of a number of the villages down this valley. And then the town is built, and people move from there into the town. That would make sense with what we, what we see. So we're beginning to see the big picture. It looks like the creation of the new town killed off our Saxon village. It's now mid-afternoon. Faye's uncovered most of her Saxon house, and she's also narrowing down its date. Well, it's Cotswolds again, but it's really crude. So Cotswolds, that's the Anglo-Saxon stuff? Yeah, yeah, but, I mean, it's really unusually thick and heavy. Um, we get stuff like this in the Midlands that's Middle Saxon, but not in this fabric. I've never seen anything quite like this before from this part of the world, and I've seen an awful lot of pottery from this part of the world. Well, that's good. We've got a first for you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and that, what date would that, that be? That would be 650 to 850. I mean, that's perfect, because that actually that dates then our beam slot. So right. we've got a Middle Saxon building. Oh, so this is from the beam slot? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting, because, I mean, if you look at Middle Saxon buildings in places like East Anglia, they're, they're, they're really quite vague structures. What you basically get is a couple of very faint, shallow beam slots where there's been wooden beams set in the ground and then upright timbers jointed into them and then the whole superstructure built around that and all they basically leave is two very faint sort of gullies. Which in is the just what we've <laughs> Which is got. what you've got, yeah. So it looks like our timeline is really clear. Our site starts off as a mid to late Saxon settlement which disappears when the town's built in 1107 and is followed by the early Norman hospital. And then a trench which so far we've overlooked suddenly pushes our story even earlier. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. This is Hook Court in Dorset, and we reckon that most of what you can see here dates to the English Civil War in the mid-1600s. But there are clues that there was once something much older and grander here. Take a look at this. You see, this 
huge moat. That is in the back garden. Now, as far as I know, a moat means a castle or a grand medieval house. So on this island, there could be something here from the Middle Ages, maybe even from the time of William the Conqueror himself. Well, there are a whole array of standard features in a medieval house. We've got, for example, the gatehouse there, and that leads you through to a great hall. But, you know, the gatehouse might have been on another side. The hall could have been elsewhere. So clearly this accommodation block wasn't destroyed by fire during the Civil War, but it's the only bit that still survives. Our job is to look for the rest of the manor house, which should be in this area defined by the moat. Sounds quite easy, doesn't it? The trouble is, there could be 500 years of different buildings buried under this lawn because the Doomsday Book records that there was a manor here way back in the 11th century. The legend is that there was a fire here in the Civil War and clearly the kids are hoping we can find out more about it. Others, though, are just as excited to see so much surviving in the ground. Oh, look, there's so many. On a right angle. So many walls. And it's only a matter of seconds before Phil turns up the first find. Yeah, maybe 1617. There's the roof. <laughs> nice nail hole in there, look. And you're getting this, which is 1617, oh, yeah. bit of bone as well. 1617. Something like that, yeah. That'd be a good, good, good candidate for when it's, you know, being heavily destroyed. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. no later stuff either. So oh, well, could, that's good. It that's could good. Be, it, it's, Let's it's carry on, Ian, please. Well. I've got your wall, Jonathan. Good man. That is, that's that's very definite, isn't it? Yep. Quite a nice or a very strong edge across there. It's pretty sturdy. <laughs> Tell you what, I was looking for, Matt. Along there is the corner of that 15th century block. Yeah. Now, we don't know how far it extended this way. I was hoping that some way, th that you'd find some way of picking up the footings as they run yeah, down here. We, we have got a, the start of a cut going across there, but I mean, it might be a robbed out wall or something like that. So there's something there. Well, it might be, but you've got a wall, but it's, a it's the wrong one. <laughs> it's, it's the right one, it's just in the wrong place. <laughs> Matt's wall is also very different to the one Phil's now unearthed in his trench. They're obviously not the same building. We're going to have to extend both trenches to see more of them. But it hasn't been a bad start, and I want to use a bit of graphics magic to show Mandy what we have sorted out. Here is the house as it is now, and if you do away with the 19th century extension over there... And in addition to that, another 19th century thing, if we get rid of this porchway just there, it's gone. Uh, and then there's this 17th century top bit, just lose all of that. And then we've got two 16th century things here and here. Off they go. And then apart from fiddling around with a few of these windows, what we've got left is the part of the building which is here now, which was here in the 15th century. That's fantastic. Not bad for one day, is it? No, not at all. It's amazing. This small trench has revealed the remains of a spiral staircase, although it's difficult to see, as only the base of it's left. Can you Point see the curving face of the stones <coughs> running around very that slight way? Curve, yeah. Very, very slight. You're actually looking at the outer casing of a spiral staircase. So we now know that there was a spiral staircase linking the two medieval ranges. We've got the first one here, which is uh, this stone bit there, and then across here, and another bit here. It's like a sort of little compressed H shape. That's the earliest. Then we've got this wall here, a little bit of it by where Phil is, and then that long bit there. Cutting through it, we've got this thing here, which is really odd, because it's curved. And actually, we've got a, a fourth phase too, haven't we? Because we've got this early stuff at the bottom. That's right. That stuff there could actually be earlier than our stones. That could be a timber phase, uh, 12th century. And it's all covered in material from the 17th century, when it's clear these buildings were demolished. Bridges Trench, in fact, may be turning up the first evidence of the Civil War fire. But what we're really after is finds like this. This is a very posh medieval floor tile. Now, I don't... Can I hold it? Yeah, of course. Now, I don't know if you can see, there's like a pattern impressed yeah, yeah, in it as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got 
salt and curved lines, yeah. Yeah, straight lines. Yeah, just... well I've kind of taken the rubbing of it with a pencil, just to give you an idea of what was going on. I don't know if you can make so this out. so intricate, isn't it? You've got the geometric pattern coming around the outside and then this sort of bit of knot work in the middle. If this isn't from a great horror chapel, I'll eat Phil's hat. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> cool. This decorated tile dates to around 1500. Part of a design that, when complete, would have looked something like this. What's just dawned on me is that our manor house probably included buildings both old and new. This is a coxcomb tile that would have adorned a roof built in the 14th century. Because typically the great hall is situated opposite the entrance, so it should be in the middle of the lawn, more or less where Bridge has opened up her trench. Given this news, Bridge in fact is wondering if she may have found the great hall. She's got bits of decorative stone from a medieval window. And this stone slab that would have supported a large post. That could be the crown jewel of the entire dig, if it's in situ. Now the most recent discovery, that there's a wall coming through here, has got our expert thinking. So after a few calculations... If we're talking about 16-foot units, which is your regular medieval pole yes. that a mason might use to set out a building, and occurs time and again, what you've got from that stone to this wall is about eight feet. Eight feet. A bit of measuring. That's 32. And the realisation that we have another wall coming through. I didn't know you even had a wall here. Well, I didn't realise that Joe had already started cleaning it until I Joe, just walked up here. Joe, your achievements <laughs> are very understated. <laughs> Jonathan's now thinking we may have found our great hall, although its position seems different from what we expected. For the last two days, we've been looking for a great hall, and we thought we'd got one in Phil's trench, going all the way down here. Pretty long this is. There was a big pad here for a big column to support the roof there, going right down to there. But just in the last few minutes, our ideas have completely changed. Why, Jonathan? Because I was looking for the logical solution of a hall going in that direction, but Bridget has turned me 90 degrees and persuaded me that it might be to do with practical expediency of an old hall sitting on firm on this site while the rest of the manor develops around it. With a wall there and a wall there. You've turned Jonathan 90 degrees. This is your theory, right? And you're absolutely convinced that this theory is right? I'm determined that this theory is right. <laughs> Beginning of day three here at Hook Court School, where we're looking for a medieval manor house, uh, and the kids have been keeping diaries about the dig. This is from day two, Seema wrote this. Today it was really cool because the six of us went to wash the pottery. We also saw a cow's jaw, which was interesting and disgusting at the same time. And this one from Connie. They film me saying they hope to find a forgotten medieval manor house. I found it quite hard because there was a big fluffy thing in my face. That's your fault, Steve. But the big news for us on day two was that right at the end of the day, we thought we'd found one of the major buildings stretching from here right over to here, except that Geofiz disagreed. John, everyone was so excited and you brought their dreams crashing to the ground. <laughs> what was the matter? Well, it's just the interpretation of the Great Hall being here. I think it's where Phil is, where all the action is. That's where all my strong signals are. I do have things coming out here on the geophysics. They are clear, but not as good as over there. Whether we solve the puzzle or not, the kids are simply amazed at how much history is buried under their school lawn. The roof tile, I think, is it? Is it? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. I mean, these tiles are sort of 14th, 15th century, but the in a 17th century deposit, so it looks like the late medieval roof still standing at the time of the Civil War and then a whole shooting match comes down, you know? Yeah. The school timetable's been amended to allow the kids to help as much as they can. Yeah. Some of the older kids are having a go at advanced geophysics. Who knows, they might be able to spot something we missed. Or maybe that there yeah. could be actual building and that could be a wall inside mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, they helped to survey this area of the lawn, and today we're opening up a trench that they'll help to dig. It's targeted on one of the clearest anomalies on the geophys plot. Well, that's this circular feature on here, look. Oh, it's wow. A nice, very, very obvious feature. There's been a lot of debate about what it might be, but I think my money's on it being a dovecut. Well, what do you understand by moat? Well, 
there's knights in armour outside, <laughs> and they're trying to get into the house, and they can't because there's this big defensive feature. Yeah, that's the problem I have when I come to this. Everybody uses the term moat. I mean, I prefer to use the term, at the moment, a water-filled ditch. Strictly speaking, a moat is a defensive ditch, but Stuart thinks this is designed to impress people rather than keep them out. If this was dug in, say, the late 14th century, people aren't really digging defensive moats in a way yeah. because they, yeah. the nature of the buildings are changing, the nature of the society is changing, and you're starting to get people thinking about decoration and ornamentation and gardens even. We've been drilling holes into our water-filled ditch and discovered that it's much deeper here compared to where it bends around the site. What's now clear is that this arm of the ditch must have been an extension added in Victorian times because it doesn't exist on this tithe map drawn in 1840. Meanwhile, at the other end of our possible Great Hall, another intriguing find is about to emerge from the soil. It's not a bit of copper pipe, is it? Yeah, we... War pipe or something. Ooh. Yep. It's a tap. It's a tap. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> this is actually a very rare find. Mick reckons it could be as early as 15th century. I think this is the best find we've had on the site, don't you? It's the best find we've had for years, that is. <laughs> you really think it's that important? Yeah, I think it's very important, yeah. We're so used to them, we forget that until the 19th century, they're very, very rare. Yeah. You know? yeah. This tap is likely to have been used with a cistern like this. It means there was running water here, and our manor house is even posher than we thought. But now it's late afternoon and time to start wrapping up some of our trenches. We have to go with our experts' conclusion that this two-storey building was a first-floor great hall, giving us a manor house that looks something like this. Our reconstruction shows Hook Court in the 15th century, the period when we know most about it. But we think this is pretty much how the manor house would have looked at the time it was set on fire during the Civil War. Soon after, all these medieval buildings were demolished, leaving only the posh lodgings and the gatehouse building standing. Well, you want us to find out about the history of Hook mm -hmm. Court. We may not have done the entire history, but we have done the entire owners of Hook Court in chronological order. Fantastic! <laughs> the genealogy <laughs> of your school. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more. <laughs>